Coming up. You running the city yet? Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, August 17, 2022 meeting of the Transportation Advisory Board of the Met Council. I called the meeting to order, and um, the first thing I wanted to talk to you about was a conversation from the exec committee. Um, let me see here. Well, let's do it this way first. Uh, is there anyone that wishes to address the uh, Council on a matter of concern to them from the general public? Okay, seeing no one coming forward, hearing nothing. I'm going to move on to the uh, approval of the agenda. We've got an agenda in front of us. Um, is there anyone who wishes to modify the agenda? Otherwise, we'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda as shown. So moved. Second. Right. So motion, second. Uh, motion by Member Anderson, second by Commissioner Gattel to approve the agenda as published. Any further conversation on that? All those in favor of adoption of the agenda is published, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, and then on to reports. I guess I got a little bit ahead of myself here. I was eager to uh, tell you about the conversation we had with the um, uh, in-house attorneys from the Met Council about hybrid meetings. It was Ann Bloodhart and David Tyson, Tyson from the Office of General Counsel. I asked... Uh, did you get a chance to make those copies? Yes. Sir. Okay, great. I think everybody has a copy of uh, uh, statutory citation 13D.02. Um, the, um, the conversation with the Met Council lawyers was that the basic uh, issue is that the open meeting law has not caught up with technology. And um, we operated under a different law during COVID uh, based on that emergency order. And, of course, we got in the groove of working really well and effectively with uh, time and everything else uh, during that period of time. But now they're telling us that we have to be operating under 13 do 2 And uh, everyone has to be able to see or hear each other. Uh, the public needs to be able to see and hear all of us. All the votes have to be roll call. And then uh, if you look at subdivision 4, that's the one that's giving uh, folks on staff, I think, pause and maybe some of our members is that we have to disclose the location of everybody uh, and you have to have, um, you have to be in a situation where you can allow the public into that location. So if you're sitting in your garage with a door open, uh, you've got to you know, then be able to invite people in to be able to participate in the meeting. So uh, apparently the League of Minnesota Cities is working on this issue uh, because I think for some of our members, um, it's, it was a lot more efficient, and I guess for all of us, it was probably more efficient. But for some folks, uh, with the employment that they have now, they cannot take that extra time to be able to come over here in that hour, hour and a half of travel, whatever it might be for folks from coming from all parts of the metro really creates difficulty. So um, it's, um, it, it's just something that we're going to have to live with for now is going back to our, our live meetings and um, <coughs> conducting them in the fashion we're doing it today. Um, as much as I enjoy the efficiency of the uh, other form, it is great to look around the room and see all the faces that uh, that mean so much to all of us, I think, and, and the conversations and the friendships that have developed over the years. So that's uh, that's the big bonus part of it. Um, that's about all I had. I think we'll cover everything else. We went through the agenda uh, in, the, in the exec committee meeting and then talked about um, some of the things that... Uh, you're going to see in the informational section of the uh, of the meeting today the statewide multimodal transportation plan, the state highway investment plan, that precipitated quite a bit of conversation at the TAB exec committee meeting. So that's uh, it for the chair's report. Oh, I guess one other thing that Charles uh, Carlson noted is that uh, you're going to see uh, in the um, uh, streamlined portion of the agenda, the consent business, uh, there's an item there about electric buses, eight electric buses. The 2022 awards just came out, and Southwest LRT has been granted an award in 2022 for $8 million for purchase of electric vehicles. So that Mr. was Chair, uh, Southwest Transit. You want to cover that in your report? No, it was Southwest Transit who got the award. Well, it's not Southwest LRT. <laughs> Southwest Transit, excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> Southwest Transit, not Southwest <coughs> LRT. Thank you for that. Um, all right, let's go to agency reports. Mike Barnes is with us today, and Member Barnes. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I do have a, a couple items. Can, is this working? 
All right, I just had to make sure because the other time I did it and it got to the end and they said it wasn't. Um, <laughs> just a, a few items here. I said I'd update a little bit on the, the TZD, um, just uh, highlight a couple items here since the last time. So far, uh, up to the August 14th time frame, there's been 250 traffic related deaths here in, in Minnesota, which is um, less than last year, but definitely still higher than the last five. Uh, it's being noted that the speed, speed related deaths are 30% less, so speed is starting to come down some. Alcohol related deaths are, uh, is not as high, but the bigger one is the motorcycle. Uh, I've been seeing there's a lot more in the paper around motorcycles. Um, it's about a, a third higher than the last five years and 90% higher than just the 2019. So you're just seeing uh, a lot more on the motorcycle side of it. So just wanted to pass, pass that along so you're starting to be aware um, from that. Um, another, another item that just for a heads up that the quarters of commerce solicitation um, from the program from the, the legislature, so from 2021 is the $200 million bond side of it. That's now open and I'll give Elaine the link and so that way if, um, uh, people can look at it. Uh, we can, uh, part area transportation, ATPs are eligible, city, county, townships, tribal government, any form, formal coalitions. Um, and of course, the metropolitan planning organizations are eligible to, to, to put in for for those. And so, um, it's one of those where I'll send the link. And we got between now and the end of um, kind of end of the November timeframe to to put those in. And then um, just to highlight too, uh, John, pass this along here. We were pretty. <coughs> sorry, here. Just give me a second. I lost my note there. Um, just uh, in, in the recent notes that came from the, the federal government about raise grants, Minnesota was pretty uh, pretty lucky. We got six uh, from Minnesota grants, and then we had one that was a North Dakota grant that has some Minnesota benefits. But just to highlight, just so you get a, a flavor from that, from the raise grants that you know, people have put in for about nine and a half million for Boys Fort. Uh, uh, where they got their grant. City of Rochester, almost 20 million. Um, for us, we had an $18 million uh, grant up in, in northern Minnesota, 12 million for Hennepin County, 15 million for the city of Plymouth, 25 million for the city of Duluth, and then that million and a half, which was uh, in Fargo, but had a had kind of a cross benefit. So when you look at it, we've you know put in as a state for grants, and so they're um, starting to see some success out of that. So. So with that, that's all that I had from you know, a quick update on items. But if there's questions of me, what was, the, what was the 15 million for Plymouth for? <clears throat> it just I it just listed here is it's from the award of 15 million. I guess I'm not sure of the details if somebody else does. I just had the list of them. Commissioner Look may know. No, I don't know on that. I just have a question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on the quarters of commerce, Member Barnes, when do those projects need to start, or is there a start and completion time frame? The 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 select the, the actual selection will be for uh, announced in May, and I think it's four within four year time frame. I guess I'll I have to get the the, the specific, specifics, but it's typically where you got about a four year window to get it started. But we'll get thank that. You. Thank you. Question, Question Mem Member Dugan. Yeah, uh, Mike, how many deaths did you say? Was it 250? 200, or two? 250. 250. As, okay. of, as of August 14th, which okay. is uh, about 11% less than last year, but yet still higher okay. than the five year average. So we're starting to see it, things kind of going downward, but definitely not where we were prior to the COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Other questions for Member Barnes? All Thank right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Todd Bewin from the MPCA is going to be a little bit late to the meeting today, so we'll hold off on his report. And then I'll turn to Carl Crimmins. Member Crimmins, anything to report out for the MAC? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a few things. Uh, we're getting ready to do a bond sale. Uh, the airport's looking to do $450 million. Our bond rating right now is at elite status. It's been just been rated by uh, Moody's and Fitch, and it's rated as elite. And they feel this is a good time to do it. 
when the Fed's going to meet, they may raise interest rates again. So they're looking to raise 450, 450 million. They're going to pay off 100 and some million of old bonds and still have 300 million for construction purposes and capital improvements. Uh, we just had an FAA inspection last month, the annual one. We had zero violations. So the FAA was quite pleased with the airport. Traffic at the airport, as ever, if everybody's been traveling, they must know traffic's up. We're, our flights are 22% less than in 2019, but the seating capacity is 5% over 2019. So the airlines are flying bigger planes, so we're moving more passengers, but there less flights. Uh, they're saying if T2, I'll let me go back a little bit, T2, Sun Country was the biggest month they've ever had in the history of the company in July. And if T2 was a standalone airport, it'd be the 58th largest airport in the United States. And then we did, as a total, T1 and T2, the MAC, we've had 25.2 million passengers in 2021. And one more point, I just want everybody to know, there's a ribbon cutting at Lake Elmo Airport on August 17th at 4.30 p.m. The new runway is finished, and they're going to have a big ribbon-cutting ceremony. So anybody that wants to attend, like I say, it's at 4.30 at Lake Elmo Airport. And that's all I have, unless somebody wants to talk about shoeshine. <laughs> Good information. Yeah. Questions for Member Crimmins? What airport operations, do you think? All right. Move on to uh, Member Barber for the Met Council. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've only got a couple of things today. Um, first of all, I want to talk um, a little about our new um, transit pass for the University of Minnesota. Beginning this fall, around 39,000 students who pay the school's transportation and safety fee will be able to ride transit simply by tapping their U-card, the same ID they use to purchase meals, access buildings, and check out books. The switch to what will be known as a universal transit pass program was endorsed by both the Metropolitan Council and the U of M's Board of Regents. Um, a four-year agreement sets minimum payments to Metro Transit that will be covered through an increase in student transportation and safety fees. Uh, students advocated for the change, which will allow them to ride for less than half of the cost of the previous program. The University of Minnesota becomes the largest school in the region to offer all students unlimited transit passes. Universal pass programs are also in effect at Augsburg University, McAllister, Anoka Ramsey Community College, Anoka Technical College, and Normandale Community College. Ridership at Augsburg and McAllister nearly doubled after their university universal passes were introduced at those schools. So we're looking to see, you know, hopefully a good opportunity to increase um, our transit ridership among the student population with this program. A uh, couple of other quick things. We had our first meeting of the TPP um, uh, work group, and I want to thank all the TAB members who are participating in that. I think we got off to a great start. Um, there will be another meeting coming up likely in September. And then also want to thank everyone who participated in the travel demand um, management uh, workshops. Um, we're really trying to use that information and gather a lot of information from a wide range of stakeholders, including employers, developers, local governments, and transportation providers about their transportation needs and, opportun er, and opportunities, and really develop a collective vision for TDM can support the needs and opportunities in the Twin Cities region. So thanks again to everyone who took some time out to attend one of those workshops. And, uh, hopefully, can participate some more in the future. With that, I'm pause for questions. That report out cause anybody to have any questions for Member Barber? <clears throat> I just Member uh, again, Mr. Chair. I, I, if I can follow up, uh, I did. I was able to attend the TDM, and it was really worthwhile. Mm -hmm. uh, the the breakout <laughs> groups were quite good, uh, and mine happened to be led by a former. Of MnDOT, uh, Chief Engineer Scott McBride, who did a really good job. And it was well attended, a lot of, <coughs> a lot of diverse people from organizations alike. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Member Barber, um, could you tell us about the work that's being done around instilling what we've talked about in the past, instilling more confidence in uh, potential ridership or ridership uh, for transit from a public safety and a, <coughs> and a public health standpoint? Uh, sure. We're continuing to work on multiple fronts for both um, public health and, and public safety, and as well um, at the same time looking to increase our ridership. Um, we have um, uh, put out um, a, a 
transit safety implementation plan that we can send the link. Um, we can make sure the link gets sent out to to everybody. But it's looking at things from multiple fronts, from um, making sure that some of the things, the steps we've already taken, like putting in real-time cameras and things like that, but it's also looking at, to having um, other um, people out on our transit system. Um, we didn't get approval for what we were calling the Transit Ambassador Program, but we found an <coughs> alternative path where we're using community service officers in that role, which would be people, another presence out on the transit system for especially when you're looking at sort of those code of conduct kind of um, um, behaviors um, that we just having someone there sometimes can mitigate some of that impact. We're also doing a lot of active work right now. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, coming from cities and counties, um, uh, hiring is a challenge not only with our operators, but we have the same thing with our police force as well. So we have gone through and recently did an analysis looking at the salaries and, and wages for our police officers and, and really took some great efforts to right size that, which meant an increase for many of our officers and our um, support staff as well. Um, and we're hoping that that helps us be competitive so that we can get our officers up to the higher level that we want. So there's multiple things going on from different fronts and I think that's going to continue. Uh, I think that it's an iterative process and we just have to make sure that we respond and react to the right things at the right time as, as the circumstances and conditions change. Okay. It cause anyone to ask any, want to ask any further questions about activities? Yes, <coughs> uh, yes one, of the, one of the focuses that I've been hearing from some of the constituents and we brought this up in the other, is, is around the uh, airport. And maybe, perhaps, I don't know, the airport is it's talking about this, too, because some of the employees there are concerned about the late night rides and the homeless issue and some of the crime and petty crime that's going on there. And maybe we've got a, con a consolidated pinpointing plan for this one. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sure. Chair. Member Grumman. Yeah, uh, we have had various discussions on the light rail. And, you know, we paid hundred million dollars to run a light rail between Terminal 1 and Terminal 2. And from 3 o'clock in the morning, or from, I think it's from midnight to 3 o'clock in the morning, the train only goes between Terminal 2 and Terminal 1. There's no public ridership on it. So all the riders that are coming from north or south, they're, they're off the trains right now. And it's just two cars go back and forth for our employees that have to park at Terminal 2. Yeah. Okay. They were allowed to park at Terminal 1 because of the pandemic. And now that the airport's getting busier, we've asked those employees to move back to Terminal 2 and ride the train. And a lot of their complaints are safety, cleanliness, and just because the people come at all hours of the day and night. And we've had some nonprofits come to the airport to tell us that they're issuing tickets to the light rail because they're full. So they're putting homeless people on light rail for the day, for the whole night. And that's why people are defecating and urinating on the train. So we have nonprofits putting these people on the train to fix their problem, but now they're creating problems for everybody else. So we, we don't know how to do that. Our chief of police has been working with Bloomington, Richfield, and uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, to put more uh, officers on the train yes. to help consolidate and to help eliminate some of these problems but until we can get people not living on the train I don't know how you're going to fix the safety problem can, can I get sure. the, Go ahead. may I please do you have the names of those nonprofits because we do well they, I can get you the name because they came and they talked at our commission meeting about six months ago okay and they told us that they just pass out these tickets once once they fill up they just pass out the tickets to the homeless and tell them to get on the train. We Spend do a lot of work with those, and we had some problems with them, too, and we were housing homeless, and they were housing homeless and in different hotels, and they were not putting up um, proper, what I would call, safety precautions either, and there was drug use and such. And we actually stepped in and helped them to put um, protections in there and actually put security and stuff. So if there's a way we could partner to help, that's what we do. So Yeah, and we're trying to... We've even gone as far as, even though we spent all this money on light rail between the two terminals... Now we're thinking about putting out a bid for a shuttle bus from oh. Terminal 2 to Terminal 1 just for the employees so they don't have to get on light rail. We could just bus them from one terminal to another. And so the staff at MAC and the chairman and everybody's working on this issue, 
is not an easy fix, you know, ev and everybody's talking about more security and more police and everything else. And it just seems like there's never enough. You know, somebody always has a horror story to bring to your committee meeting about being accosted and being threatened and things like that. So I, we just don't want something to happen negative. Yes, I agree. I agree. Until but let's we, see if we, we need to do something bef yes. proactively before something bad happens, and then we have to face the music that we didn't do enough. Yes. So, Member Barber has a comment. Yeah, very quickly. I think um, along the talking about the cooperation among departments, um, there's been active discussions between our interim chief grades with the um, Metropolitan Airport. Uh, um, MAC um, police as well. Um, so we're trying to make sure we get a, ahead of the situation and um, as much as possible. But those uh, conversations are on an ongoing daily, weekly basis. So. Mm -hmm. <coughs> How does your transit ridership compare uh, in 2022 to 2019? I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but um, I believe that we're close to back to about 67%. So especially <coughs> the only, like we're getting back to um, higher levels on especially local routes, ABRT and the LRT. Um, the big chunk that we still don't have back is for commuter um, service, which is still significantly less. All right. But we get it actually update on our uh, uh, second quarter um, ridership, I think, at Transportation Committee next week, and I can bring a full summary of numbers next time. And, sure. and, and yes, Commissioner, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to go back to the conversation previously about safety and homelessness. And um, as Ramsey County and I know Hennepin County were saddled with doing this work, even though the situation of those who are unsheltered are not just from our counties. Um, and I would say if you're willing to pay for additional security, maybe we could have a conversation about helping us solve the homeless problem. Uh, it will save money in the long run and we'd like to partner. So I just want to make an open and public invitation to come help us with the, the problem so that we're not just adding more security and we're actually getting yeah. to the root cause of the issue. Exactly. Yeah, good. Chair. Nice offer, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, Member Barber, I, I think I've asked you this before, but when, when you think about how to rebuild the uh, confidence around transit, and we all want a vital uh, transit system um, that's really effective in our metropolitan area. Do you look around the world to see who's having success at, um, in transit operations and other, other, other cities around the world that we should be modeling ourselves after to rebuild our system as quickly as possible? We definitely do. Um, and we both from ridership, what modes, what options, um, to public safety, I will say the problems and concerns with some of the ridership that we're talking about, you're hearing about all over. I mean, this isn't just a Twin Cities um, concern. It's, it's everywhere. Um, and every agency is trying to get ridership back. Um, we're doing much better. Um, I think that um, in several of our routes, I think one of the key things that's given us an advantage that when we look through regions is our a focus on ABRT lines. That's one of the areas that we really kept more ridership even during the pandemic. And we found that people were shifting some of their use, not even in peak rush hour and times to go to work, but to go run their errands, to go to some of those things. So they were using the transit system as an element of moving around in their daily lives. And I think that it's going to be interesting as we sort of watch these trends going out into the future, um, what that looks like. Um, when it looks as, when you look at some of the stuff we're doing from a public safety perspective, like where we've, we've done this really thorough look and, and the work with, um, 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 the group um, that we did our public safety look at and our work on our, our police work group and some of these things. I think we're actually um, leaders of how we're doing this and came up with uh, these are the things we're doing right. These are the things that we have to fix. These are the conversations we need to have. And I think that that could be something where we actually are the people what people will look to um, as they look to how to improve some of the safety elements on the transit system. Uh, because a lot of people are having the same problem. I think we're really trying to be proactive about it. Thank you for that, Member Barber. All right, that caused anyone else to ask a question? Member Hollinshead. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, the people I talk to, and maybe I'm, I'm an old white guy, so yeah, I talk to mostly white guys. I, that's not my choice, but um, 
I wonder why it's legal for nonprofits to hand out tickets when they're not for a transportation purpose. Why, why is it legal for a nonprofit to actually go to another agency and say, we're doing this, as if it's something they should be doing? We're not solving the housing cri uh, crisis by um, using transportation for housing. <clears throat> and so I think until we address the I mean, this is just one small proportion of the total problem, but we need to address why we're not, or other agencies that are responsible or the body politic at large, needs to address the housing shortage for homeless people in a much more aggressive manner so that we're not using transportation, which costs billions and billions of dollars, these rail projects, so we're not using them for housing. So that's my rant. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that. Anyone else? All right. Uh, I don't think we have anybody with us today from the suburban transit providers. I think um, Dan was unable to be here. Right. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we'll hold off, as I said, on Todd B. Uh Chair Solberg, do you have anything to report out for the TAC before we go to the minutes? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As been the case in the past, I'll just uh, go through the consent item and uh, what TAC has been up to uh, for TAB members today. So um, that first item that's in your consent agenda. To, well, let's go. Let's approve those minutes first before oh, we get there. Right. I just thought maybe you had something else you wanted to report on relative to the TAC operation. First. Nothing more than uh, we did review those items. Uh, of okay. The SMTP TAC bylaws. I, this might be of interest to this group. TAC is not uh, necessarily subject to the open meeting law. Our TAC uh, bylaws were prohibiting some pieces of that, and so we've revised that, um, and that will be moving forward. Next month, though, however, uh, the TAC will review um, if the, the hybrid or, or the, the virtual uh, format is going to continue to work for us. And at that point, we'll decide if we'll come back in person or continue in a hybrid or a virtual environment. Good. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, any changes, corrections, additions to the minutes of June 15, 2022? Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the so amendments. Moved. Second. Member Anderson moves. Commissioner Gattel seconds the adoption of the minutes as published for June 15, 2022. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the June 15, 2022 minutes of the tab say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. All right. Now, back to Chair Solberg. And the uh, items that we have before us, both consent and non-consent. I think the uh, non-consent item deserves a little bit of attention too, so go ahead. Yep, so thank you, Mr. Chair. So that uh, first uh, consent item for everybody, 22-28 uh, uh, streamlined TIP amendment, is really uh, Metro Transit had received a uh, grant for low or no emission vehicle program. That was a specific program carved out for that uh, purpose of uh, low and no emissions. So they did receive a grant to approximately $5 million. Uh, they are in the process of getting that added to the tip and which will lead to the purchase of eight electric buses, uh, additionally some staff training and uh, some technical assistance that would help with the implementation of those electric buses. And with that, stand for any comments. All right, good. Any questions on that? Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion to approve 2022-28. Uh, so moved. Thank you, Commissioner. Second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Malushnik. All right, uh, we've got a motion and a second to approve the uh, item 2022-28, which is the streamlined tip amendment on the purchase of the bus buses for Metro Transit. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the motion as stated, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And then uh, we're on to non-consent business that requires action. Yes, Mr. Chair. So the first uh, non-consent item, 22-29, uh, is a public comment report and recommendation approval of the 23 to 26 transportation improvement plan. Uh, Joe Barbeau is with us to, to provide uh, overview of that. Uh, the recommendation, of course, on this one is to approve the 23 to 26 transportation improvement plan and recommend that the council accept public comments for the 23 to 26 transportation improvement plan. Joe? Thanks, Chair Solberg and uh, Mr. Chair members. My apologies for leaving the, leaving the um, public comment part off of the uh, 
off of the motion. Uh, we're working on our motions, but um, you will be doing that, uh, accepting that, or hopefully forwarding that on to the council. So I present, presented a presentation on the TIP Transportation Improvement Program uh, in May when you released it for public comment. And in that period of time, we had a 45 day public comment period that ended on July 6th. We received between that comment period and a virtual meeting that we held about 30 comments from about 17 people. There weren't really any themes or a lot, uh, um, a lot of project and TIP related themes to talk about or, or to address. It was mostly uh, big picture comments It'll sort of be forwarded on to other partners and to other processes. I will say that um, we did get a handful of, of changes, for, uh, requested changes from Hennepin County. All pretty small funding amounts that were all local, so we did uh, reflect those changes in the TIP, so as not to have to make any amendments or uh, modifications later on. Otherwise, there is a small list of, oh, I'm sorry, I should say a list of small changes attached to the action transmittal, and my apologies, we did get that there, I think, on Monday uh, for MnDOT, and those are the kind of changes that go through um, every cycle. So other than that, you've seen the tip, and for the most part, in its form uh, when you release it for public comment. Uh, talk a little bit about the public comments. Um, uh, we did, like I said, we didn't receive uh, nearly as many as last time. And I'm going to give a little summary. Give me, bear with me for a second. Um, uh, but we did, um, using social media, uh, we had uh, 260 unique visitors to our webpage. Uh, we had 312 people um, see the Facebook, first Facebook post, 273 see the next, 290 see the third. A number of people see the Twitter posts and things of that nature. And we did have a number of people, uh, eight attendees and five people speak at our public meeting. Um, with that, I would stand for questions about the public comments and or the tip itself. Tab members, any questions for Mr. Barbell? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Martinson. Member I've actually Martinson. got a couple of questions. Um, one is, and, and this is related both to, to this set of public comments, but also in the subsequent item that we're going to be discussing as well. So there's responses here to the, to the comments that are offered. Are, where and, and how are the responses provided back to the commenters? That's one question. And then are these comments or the responses to them, are they posted publicly somewhere? And where and when does that happen? And then the, the, the third question that I had is um, about vetting of the comments. Uh, in particular, when you're looking at these online forums, it's pretty obvious that there's at least one uh, internet troll who has entered comments in here that are clearly not real. Um, and in fact, when I went to look up that individual online, it didn't take me long to determine that there's no one lives in this metro area by that name, sure, Key Swank. But there is a, a known internet troll who lives in Grand Forks, North Dakota by that name. <laughs> so uh, that concerns me that we've got comments that are being entered into the public um, that are clearly not genuine. And so I don't know what can be done to vet those kind of online comments, but um, that seems like that is potentially a problem. So three questions in total. Um. So to start with that last one, well, there might be, I'm going to forget the last one because there might be others here that can fill in, but I will say that it's difficult to weed out those or to tell, to tell you that they shouldn't come or even to tell you that they shouldn't come for people that don't live in the region. And I'm poking around these comments to know that there's also somebody I believe named I'm sick of cars or something like that. So we're not really historically vetting for real names or discounting uh, people that either aren't from the region or don't feel like using the real name. Uh, that might be a comment that that uh, comes up during the next discussion. So as far as, um, and you might end up reminding me of your first two questions a little bit, but uh, as far that's as- That's fair. So the first, <laughs> the first question was about uh, if these responses that are offered here are given back to the commenters. Um, they can be, uh, uh, and it might be dependent on what information they give us um, in terms of their own contact information. Um, more importantly, or as importantly, they're also forwarded on to case by case, the right group to, uh, to see them. Sometimes um, some of those comments are pertinent to MnDOT or some of our local, um, per, uh, yep. local cities and counties. So um, yeah, we can, we can do that. I don't know that we specifically have a policy to do that, but we certainly can and, I, and I, I, we will um, to those who provided us the right information to get that back to them. 
That's fair. And then the second question was about where these, uh, whether the comments and, and or the responses are publicly made available subsequently somewhere um, and where. They are by virtue of being on the tab agenda now and will be also at the council. Um, we have a tip webpage where I can put them there. I think we put the public comment reports there the last couple of cycles, so we can do that or we will do that. Ms. Maskey. Um, I could add a little bit to that. We do not require uh, individuals to provide contact information. Um, so we don't typically send individual responses back to individual people. However, we do uh, present these at our public meetings. Presumably those that are, have provided comment can access it through the public meetings. And then, as Joe mentioned, we do post the public comment report on the website. But if we do have a specific com contact, let's say at Minnesota 350, mm -hmm. we do respond, we can respond directly to their, to their questions. All right, thank you. Member Barber, did I see your hand up? No, okay, thank you. Uh, just waving for Sarah to come up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. This is Maskey, all right. Mr. Martinson, any follow-on? Member Martinson? No, oh, that's good. Thank you. All right, good. And then, of course, um, if uh, we have the motion as, uh, if there's a motion made consistent with what the tax chair is suggesting, those public comments will be appended, they'll be received and appended to the report itself. So, I'll make that motion, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, we've got a motion from Commissioner Gattel that the um, Transportation Advisory Board recommend the adoption of the draft 2023 through 2026 Transportation Improvement Program to the Met Council and that the TAB recommends acceptance of the public comments uh, by the Metropolitan Council from the public to the 2023 through 2026 TIP. Any, second. is there a second? Second. All right, second from Member Geisler. Any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, Member Hollinshead. So I wonder if we can do anything about the uh, the troll issue when we uh, recommend to the Met Council that uh, the comments be appended. Is there any reason that we should or should not comment on that? I'm just wondering. Member Geisler, you had your hand up. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I would just counter with that. I don't think we want to get in the business of filtering public comment. That's the whole point of it. I think if there's vulgar language or things that are maybe not fit for public consumption, there's maybe some asterisking or blanking out that, that can be reasonably done. But uh, public comment is public comment, and it comes in all shapes and forms. Those of us who have ever been to a, a meeting with it um, have seen various versions of that. So I, as much as we may know that it's not a valid or not a reasonable comment, we should still post it and post it. Commissioner Lick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm going to have to deviate a little bit from that from the standpoint that every public comment forum that we have generally requires an address so where you located, you know, kind of justifies the fact that you are a person within that community or what I mean, similar to your city council meetings. I think if somebody from Anoka County came to to cry about something you're doing, you might discount that. And I think we probably should too if somebody's coming from out of state. I know we have comments from the Sierra Club and everybody else that weighs in on a lot of things that may or may not live here. So I think we have a fiduciary responsibility to our people here. Um, there are people that are dealing with transportation and transit related issues here in Minnesota. And I don't know that I would necessarily take too kindly to someone from the South weighing in on a topic that doesn't impact them, for example. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Maskey, in the work that you do, uh, you don't require anybody to divulge uh, any contact information. So That's is that something we might do? I mean, I don't see where that would inhibit uh, them commenting, but it, would, it may uh, allow us to sort of screen through things a little bit without endangering. Mr. Chair and members, um, I would agree with that, that we don't want to screen. Um, people out. However, I, to your point, I am happy to bring that up as we look at doing the revisions to the Met Council public engagement plan as we go into the 2050 process. And I will bring those comments to um, our team as we look at updating that plan. Okay. 
All right, I think it's worth, it's a commissioner. Worth a conversation. Go ahead, Commissioner. I, I would agree with some level of identification. Yes, for the name. So I would think either the city or county. It, it's not. That's not very invasive. That's what we require on almost every other public format. The other thing too, if they're consuming a lot of <coughs> wording and a lot of answers, you, you can always put a word count limit or something to that. If part of what I understood is maybe they're just filling the space a lot, and uh, if they're doing that in a malicious way, I'm fine with it if it's all credible comments, but um, a word count limit is something you see often. Member Geisler? Uh, I'll just make a practical comment here. Liz. Unless we're validating that and trying to find that person and that address and information, you can put whatever you want in there. Um, so there's there's a little bit of challenge there. You put a word count limit, just keep submitting the forms over and over again. Um, you know, so I, I guess I just look at it and go, there's a certain level of staff resource of trying to implement some of these preventative measures. There's nothing stopping me from walking into a council meeting and saying I'm a resident of the city and unless they go look it up, they don't know either. Yeah. Um, not that I would advocate for that, but let's be practical here with a web form. Anybody can get there and it becomes very challenging to do that. On top of that, that exposes you then to start handling data, data privacy stuff under state statute, which is a whole nother layer of conversation. Um, so just for what it's worth, it, it adds a lot more work to start to try to do that than on the surface. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes. Um, in response to a word limit, we do use the web form as the primary tool for, <laughs> for collecting information, but people can also call, they can send an email, they can send a letter. So I don't think it's really practical in putting a word limit on a form when there are other methods for folks to be able to provide comment. All right. Member Barber. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think it's important <coughs> that we do have opportunities to receive all comments in. There may be a mechanism by which maybe we have um, in our public comment report flagged um, some of these of going, hmm, maybe this <coughs> one isn't um, quite what we're looking for or something like that, but still have the ability to receive them in so that we're not missing something. Because to me, making decisions on these things and missing some of that comment is more potentially destructive so um, but we could have a way to flag some of these things so it's easily noticed in the public comment reports all right further comments commissioner mr i i don't want to limit comments i don't think that's what people are saying here i think what we're saying is that we want people to identify where they're from that's pretty easy to do now as far as the deception part of it goes people can deceive however they wish i mean you're not going to stop deception but i think the majority of people out there would if asked to, to input where they're from, probably would put where they're from. And I think that's reasonable. All right. Well, I think you heard a lot of, uh, of, of, of attempts to assist you in the work that you're doing, and <laughs> hopefully trying to streamline it a little bit, but make sure that we get good reporting we, we out of it and, and helpful them. information. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. We, we always look to improve the process. and. Implementing a form was an improvement in the process um, because we used to just get them all in through email, which made it much more difficult for us to process and to, and to go through. Um, and to the point about requiring a location from, from people who submit comments, we also, there's no way really to do that in email, phone, and written letters as well. So just just uh, keep keeping in mind that we're trying to keep the process as open as possible. But I will bring it up as part of the review of the public engagement plan and our and our methods for moving forward. Yep. All right. Member Martinson found that troll and look at the conversation <laughs> that uh, sprang forth from that. <laughs> just one follow up. I, I I guess I like I really like the suggestion of just maybe having staff flag comments that are maybe suspicious rather than going to any more elaborate links. And I mean honestly, you know, ha have a thirteen year old vet these, they'll find the trolls immediately. It's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could also, when we're looking at, uh, we do get comments through Twitter and Facebook and those types of things, and and people do not necessarily use their real information um, on, on those platforms as well. So 
that's that's another challenge. Well, we're not going to suggest that you put an additional <laughs> couple of columns in there that go for credible, not credible, <laughs> and put yourselves at risk. So we'll just let you do your own internal weighting of the credibility Fair. of your comments and decide what you're going to respond to, and, and then let us know about it as you have done today. Thank you. So we got a motion and a second in front of us. Any further discussion? All those in favor of ad uh, adopting the motion as stated uh, relative to action transmittal 2022-29 say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you. And this, Ms. Maskey, thanks for, you're right here. Let's handle the next matter. <laughs> I'll just carry forward then. Um, I am here today to uh, present the public comments for the transportation addendum to the public engagement plan. And um, just wanted to say that this was running about concurrently at the same time that the TIP public comment was. So 45 days, we had a public hearing at Transportation Committee um, at the end of June. And we had a total of nine commenters that resulted in 18 comments. Um, there are a few themes I just wanted to pull out for folks to consider. So one, one was to maintain a virtual option to attend Met Council and advisory committee meetings and provide public comments. Um, the second was transparency in public comments and how they do or do not impact Met Council decisions. Um, they're indicating a shift from public engagement to community influence. Then uh, promoting the public comment periods on Met Council assets, including transit and platform digital advertising. And then recognizing public comments and public engagement from locally adopted transportation plans, <clears throat> excuse me, and planning processes. These didn't result in any substantive changes to the, uh, the report itself, but we are looking into ways that we can incorporate, incorporate local feedback into um, our overall processes. That's gonna take a little bit of work and a lot of cooperation, so we're looking into ways that potentially we could do that. Um, I've talked with Metro Transit about how we might use transit assets, and they are open to that, largely with the digital screens at platforms and then internal bus advertising. Um, and as far as the virtual option, you discussed um, hybrid meetings at the beginning of this. There are concerns along those lines, and I've been having discussions with OGC to, to, to discuss whether or not that's an option. So with that, um, I will stand for any questions. Any questions for Ms. Maskey on item 2022-30? All right, uh, so what we, we talked about this uh, uh, a bit in the exec committee. The federal government requires that we have a public engagement plan. The council has a public engagement plan. And all we're recommending is that the Transportation Advisory Board uh, suggests that the council adopt the trans transportation addendum, which is the federal document, to, the, to its own public engagement plan. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, this year we had a conversation with the FHWA about having a separate plan for transportation versus the overall public engagement plan for the Met Council. And it makes sense for us to do this as an addendum. To that point, we're making updates to this plan before we're making the updates to the public engagement plan. So there are many things that are folded into this plan that will then be translated into the larger public engagement plan. So I just wanted you to be aware. The tribal relations, for instance, mm -hmm. is one of that. The expanded list of tools that we have available for us for doing public engagement will also likely feed into the, the public engagement plan. And then it will not be specific to just transportation. That precipitate any comments or thoughts from members? All right. Is there a uh, motion to adopt action transmittal 2022-30 uh, that the Transportation Advisory Board recommend to the Met Council the adoption of the transportation addendum to the Council's public engagement plan? So moved. Second. Who is the seconder? Thank you. 
All right, we got a motion second on uh, the motion as stated. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the motion as stated relative to action transmittal 2022-30 say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And thank you for that thank good you. work. Thank you, Ms. Maskey. And thank you, Chair Solberg. And now we're going to move on to that portion of the agenda that involves uh, information items. And we've got uh, Hallie Turner with us, um, who's going to take us through the statewide multimodal transportation plan. Hi, Turner, Chair. Turner, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Hallie Turner, I use she, her pronouns. Policy Planning Director with MnDOT. I think this is going to be my first and only presentation to you all for the statewide multimodal transportation plan that's currently out for public comment. To be very clear, we have presented on a number of occasions to the Transportation Committee. I think we were even at TAB Executive Committee once, TAC, TAC Planning, and the Capital Improvement Committee. So we, we've hit the litany of Met Council uh, committees, but this was the one and only time that we're with you today. I'm going to use the acronym SMTP to save some time on our agenda and hopefully not bombard you with a bunch of uh, background slides, just one. So the statewide multimodal transportation plan is focused on answering how are we going to achieve the Minnesota Go vision. The Minnesota Go vision is a 50 year vision that says our multimodal transportation system will maximize the health of people, the environment and the economy. It is a mid dot led vision, but it does apply to all agencies with a role implementing transportation in Minnesota. So including MPOs. The SMTP sets forward objectives, performance measures, strategies and actions that collectively are the policy direction that provides input to the modal and system plan. For example, SMTP informs the state highway investment plan that you're gonna hear next about Brad Utech, and I hear that it was an engaged debate at the executive committee meeting. Uh, so this is, that's the policy flow. Also, uh, to be very clear, it also informs MPO plans. As part of our background information, we did look at Thrive MSP as well as the TPP to see where we were out of alignment in our commitments. And then as we have been collaborating with Met Council staff on TPP 2050, they have been reviewing our draft document as well to see how we can continue to be lockstep as we proceed forward. So our document also informs the plan for the Met Council. I want to focus on key changes for since 2017. Consider that this is an update from the 2017 plan. Uh, it's hard to do a summary of 322 pages in 10 minutes, so I thought that I would just focus on where things feel and are different from the commitments that we have made as transportation. So consider that we're business as usual, unless you hear otherwise. Um, Starting first, we need to shift to focus on more climate friendly transportation options. Emphasis here on options. We're focused on providing more and better options that provide opportunity for people to travel using something other than internal combustion single occupant vehicle. I'll share a little bit more in one slide. Some of the commitments that will hopefully move us forward to this end state include a greenhouse gas emission target, 100% by 2050, that is net zero, in alignment with the Paris Accord. It's a pretty significant lift from where we're at currently today. One of the things that we need to be able to accomplish that is a zero emission light duty vehicles sold target. We are shooting for 100% by 2040. I think we're at 6%, 3%, we're sing low single digits right now. So again, another significant lift that we need to make over the next couple of decades, um, but imperative to be able to help us meet the greenhouse gas emission target. We also have a target to reduce uh, vehicle miles traveled per capita, 14% by 2040. If you have been tracking the recommendation from the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council under the leadership of Tim Sexton and Nissa Tupper, we are in alignment with that. Our horizon is 2040, their horizon is 2015, 2050. 14% per capita is the same as 20% per capita by 2050. Uh, and then we also need to develop system and asset resilience, resiliency measures. We do acknowledge part of having a climate friendly transportation system is also having a resilient system and to be able to make investment operations and maintenance decisions, we need to make sure that we have data that helps to point us accordingly. 
So quick notes on the VMT target. I want to be very clear, this is not a dictate or a mandate to any individual person or business to decrease their travel. And it is not a goal. That has been language that has been used around this target. I want to impress upon us that it is a way for us to measure operations of the transportation system in pursuit of increasing options to promote health, equity, and safety. And it will join a suite of other measures that include increasing access for walking, increasing access for biking, taking transit, better transit, all in support of decreasing carbon emissions. The 14% per capita by 2040, 20% per capita by 2050 is in alignment with local and national efforts. We're kind of middle of the pack for agencies around the Twin Cities that have their own targets. And nationally, we're also in alignment with other states that have provo proposed VMT targets as well. The next bucket of changes focuses on equity, and we want to make sure that we are implementing equity in transportation decision making. We, to the other committees that we've been able to present to, have had many conversations around a transportation equity definition that is now a transportation equity statement of commitment, which I will share on the next slide. We have several strategies and actions that are intended to build capacity to advance transportation equity equity, and collectively, if we put them into practice, we'll be able to, as an industry, as agencies, be able to move these commitments forward. And then much like climate, we need performance measures to be able to inform near-term and long-term decision-making and are in the process of developing those target measures and targets. So for the transportation equity definition, we started in late 2020, early 2021, put out a draft definition for people to react to. We've talked to over 1,000 Minnesotans to get feedback on that. And as a result of those conversations, we have now tr shifted to what we call a transportation equity statement of commitment, answering what does transportation equity mean for MnDOT. And this serves two purposes. One, we can deepen our own commitment as an agency. So rather than just saying, a definition, we can say this is what we actually intend on doing as part of that process. It also allows us to not be as prescriptive to our partners, so our partners have more latitude to be able to determine how best to serve your con constituency around transportation equity. The statement of commitment is in four parts, an acknowledgement of the legacy of harm, a MnDOT definition, the statement of commitment, those actions that MnDOT is committing to, and a list of terms. The very last slide in your presentation has the first three bullets in totality so you can read the language. It was a little too much to fit on one slide. And then the third bucket of key changes. We want to improve health outcomes and reduce disparities. Probably more significantly here is a shift to safe systems approach. We heard uh, Mike Barnes acknowledge the towards zero death. This is a deepening and an evolution of some of the work that we have done around towards zero deaths, similar to Vision Zero. We're trying to acknowledge uh, kind of two aspects of human behavior. One, we make terrible decisions, especially when we're driving. Two, we're exceptionally vulnerable to kinetic energy in a crash. So safe system approach is trying to acknowledge those two kind of pain points and to design a system that makes it as easy as possible for people to make the right decision and then to be less susceptible to um, the severity of a crash or uh, yeah, crash. Uh, we also have a target to increase walking and biking uh, for people to do at least once a week by 2040. 60% again is a lot. And we have not separated recreation from transportation, but to be able to get to 60%, we know that people are going to have to start walking and biking for shorter trips for us to be able to accomplish that target. And another more notable commitment, we want to do some work around urban heat islands. We've had some high heat days this year, for example, and the impervious surface of the transportation system contributes to the impacts. And we also have opportunities to mitigate it accordingly. Those were the key uh, changes, but to acknowledge out loud, there are a number of commitments that have stayed the same. We want to continue to ensure inclusive and collaborative decision making. We know that partnerships are so central to making sure that our system works across jurisdictions and boundaries that are very arbitrary for the traveling public. 
We want to continue to provide safe and convenient movement of people and goods. The, the language in this plan focuses more on people, and we've heard that it's anti-freight. I want to tell you that it is not. We do know that freight, the movement of goods, is central to economic <coughs> vitality. Uh, we just tried to use more people-focused language in our document. We want to continue to preserve the existing system while considering strategic improvements to improve operations for everybody and want to also continue considering social, environmental, and economic impacts as it relates to transportation decision making. We are available, available for public comment. So staff are available to come do presentations. I am able to share communications material to encourage people to submit comments by September 18th. We have a public hearing on September 7th. We will be in person at central office across from the Capitol, across the freeway. We will also be in person in all of MnDOT's greater Minnesota headquarters. The first hour, four to five, is going to be an open house in person. Five to six is a public hearing that's in person at all those same locations, also available for web conference for anyone that's only able to attend virtually. And we would love to see folks show up any location or web conference uh, between four and six on the seventh. We will be incorporating feedback late this fall, hoping for a fall adoption. I would really love to have a 2022 SMTP and not a 2023 SMTP. So we're gonna, we're gonna try to get it in before December. Uh, so my call to action for you all, submit comments. We are accepting them via email, mail, and at Minnesota Go. When you go to the web address, you're going to be linked to our document where you're able to comment on specific sections of the document. So all of the content is available to comment. If there's a paragraph that you're like, I don't really like what you're doing here, you can click on the, on the paragraph, submit your comment, and then it's immediately available in a spreadsheet that is viewable by the public so that people can see what other comments have been submitted. I will just show you that the statement of commitment language is on the last slide. And I have just a handful of uh, gratitudes that I would like to share because this has been a very heavy lift over three years in a pandemic. And we've had a number of people that have contributed. I think all told, we've had about 200 people in our advisory committees. We've connected with 6,500 Minnesotans. Chair Zelli, uh, Commissioner Jim McDonough and Mayor Doug Anderson have served on our policy advisory committee. We have had Amy Venowitz, Deb Hauser with the City of St. Louis Park, and Wayne Sandberg with Washington County on our technical advisory committee. On our, we had six work groups. Met Council staff were on all six work groups. They participated, I think, in three staff to staff meetings. Uh, I think eight MPO director meetings, and they did a substantial review of a draft that we had in April before public comment. So I just wanna thank everyone for the very heavy lift that went into having this document in front of you today. Chair. Yes, thank you, very nice presentation, Ms. Turner. Uh, questions for Ms. Turner, comments? Yes, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for this presentation and for all the work that went into it. I, I have a couple questions. How do you see this document being used so that there's actual outcomes and that it's not just another bound document that a lot of work went into that no one reads or uses in the future? Um, what does implementation look like? And then what does the accountability and um, evaluation look like? Because it doesn't mean anything to have commitments if we don't follow through or hold ourselves accountable. So what does that look like? Chair, Commissioner, uh, implementation. I'm going to start with the implementation question. We do have Chapter 6, uh, which is the MnDOT specific work plan that's set for the next five years. This is a 20 year horizon. So the five years is what MnDOT uh, feels it can reasonably start. We can't necessarily complete everything in five years, but it's things that we hope that we can start. Um, that is hopefully the first step in making sure that it is a plan that does not sit on a shelf. That's always the terror of a planner is that it's not going to be implemented. So as far as accountability and evaluation, we don't have a history of doing that work and I'm hoping that we can change that. I have been short-staffed and unable to set up an accountability structure, so I don't have a great answer for you there. One thing that we do is with the next update, we evaluate the progress that we made on the previous plan. So we at least have some transparency in five years to acknowledge 
what progress we made, where we didn't make progress, where we need to do a lot more work. And when we did that evaluation for the 2017 plan, it did have substantial contributions to the commitments that we made in this one. Uh, for example, we have not made good on a lot of our climate change commitments, so we decided to double down on that to communicate the urgency. So the accountability processes are a little bit longer winded than what I think you were hoping to hear. Well, thank you. Can I have one hey, Commissioner, question? go ahead. Thank, thank you. I really appreciate that. Is there any way to maybe in the commitment, like we're committed to do this, to also make sure that aligns with investment? Because these changes, for instance, in walkability, bikeability, heat islands are going to come at a cost. Now, it is a good pay, pay it forward cost, so I agree with it, but I want to make sure that we're committing to invest the dollars required yeah. to make these commitments uh, in the future. Chair, Commissioner, that will be a great segue for Brad Utech's presentation on the Minnesota State Highway Investment Plan. Uh, the State Highway Investment Plan is kind of the pathway that MnDOT has to inform investment decisions. Uh, Policy-wise, we are hoping to reevaluate some of the policy structures that we have that make financial commitments. Uh, we have a very long-winded title for our cost participation policy that I never remember. It's incomplete in the document, but for example, we want to open up our cost participation policy to review what does it mean to be able to invest to be in alignment with these commitments. So I hope that we'll get there. Thank you. Other questions? For Ms. Turner? Okay. Commissioner? Kelly, uh, good job presenting. Uh, really concise and mm -hmm. rambled through a lot of information. My question is, and I really like the way we get feedback, but it's kind of like going online and you mentioned hitting the tab. And I mean, it's really user friendly, but so many of the people that um, use transportation, I don't think are that techie, have a laptop, and but yet, you know, when we put like the goal line where you're community outreach and you're really seeking out people, it takes a lot of money and time. So is there a, some level of version of that you're doing just to the everyday citizen that may not be techie and aware? I don't think a lot of people are going to say, hey, I'm going to contribute to my uh, future uh, uh, progress in these areas. Chair, Commissioner, uh, we do not have a plan right now for the public comment period. I would say it is a little bit more administrative, a uh, lot more detailed. We did a lot of that work as part of the public engagement processes. When we, our scope went out March 6th, 2020. So all of my uh, consultant proposals came back at the start of shutdown, and I was <coughs> utterly petrified, petrified that we would not be able to connect with Minnesotans. And we did so much pivoting and innovating and tr just piloting solutions that, as stated, we ended up connecting with over about 6,500 Minnesotans, which is on par with what we've done with in-person engagement in the past. And we uh, have invested more heavily in being able to connect with people that are least likely to participate in our processes. Uh, I use the acronym BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color. We had um, financial assistance to community-based organizations to host meetings on our behalf. For example, we had one event where there were 85 participants that had an event exclusively in Vietnamese. If I had done like translation materials, I would not have had that kind of reach uh, for people that speak Vietnamese. So we had comics, uh, so a very approachable way to develop some awareness of the topics that we were discussing. Try to summarize transportation equity in eight comic panels. It's really hard. But we did it, and we also translated it into three languages, Spanish, uh, Hmong, and Somali. Um, those are just a couple of examples where we really focused on black, indigenous, people of color, low-income folks, and counties that we haven't heard from in previous planning cycles as background for all of the information that's in front of you. So I, I made the commitment as a project director to do that heavy lift while we were developing the content rather than coming to them once it's already written. Thank you. Other questions, comments yeah. on this work? Okay, Ms. Turner, um, I raised this uh, in the exec committee too, and I don't know how you go about addressing this issue, but 
You know, when you think about the very first question that you raised, how are we going to treat, how are we going to go about achieving the Minnesota Gold Vision? And when you look at Minnesota Gold Vision, it's a it's a, it's a generational transportation vision. And when I think about generational transportation visions, I think about well, what are we going to do to um, take this this sector, transportation sector, that's the biggest greenhouse gas emitter that we have now and reduce that load on the planet. And you've got some ideas in here, but I don't see anything in here about new technologies that might be coming down the way. And the reason I thought of it was because I'm involved with a bunch of folks in Minnesota here looking at magnetic levitation for trains that are, that are net zero. You know, Could we put a train between here and Rochester underground that would go 750 miles an hour? Does it make sense to study that option and have that be a way of having moving people and goods 500 miles or less because you can do it um, so effectively and efficiently. Anyway, so I'd like to see some. I'd like to see something in MnDOT. You know, you've got that great research department you're doing both with respect to materials and thinking through other things with Center for Transportation uh, Studies at the university. But uh, I think you guys, with your good minds over there, ought to be thinking about what's, what's the next big transportation technology? How are we going to make a big leap forward here and, and get past what we've been doing for the last 100 years? Thank you, Chair. We uh, took the route of saying zero emission rather than electric vehicle to be more inclusive of technology that will come. Uh, so I do hope that leaves an open door for the recommendations. Yeah. OK, good. That's Thank all you. I have. Anybody else? Thank you. Then we'll bring Brad up. We can talk about the 20 year state highway investment plan. Mr. Utech, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. It should be coming up. My name is Brad Utech with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Had a good introduction from Hallie there. Um, I'm here to talk about the 20 year Minnesota state highway investment plan. Our other long-range plan that's currently being updated as well, uh, the multimodal plan is more on the policy side. This is investment, so it kind of ties in that question we got before. Um, so thanks for having us. Um, we are planning for the future of the state highway system, and we are looking for input from everyone on how to invest on that system. So what are we planning for? What is Minship? Uh, it directs capital funding on state highways in Minnesota. So one key distinction from the plan Hallie talked about, that's all transportation in Minnesota. This plan is specifically <coughs> investment on MnDOT state highway system. Um, so it limits a few of the things we can invest on. Um, just want to note that. So it directs capital funding for that 12,000 mile system. It's also a fiscally constrained plan. So we have to estimate how much money we think we're going to have over 20 years and then we develop an investment direction to spend that money. One other thing to note about this plan, um, the investments are by category and they're not project specific. So if you look at the previous versions of the plan, looking for a project in your area, you're probably not gonna see it. Um, this plan develops projects and investments, or develops investments, sorry, uh, by investment category. So that's how much money are we spending on pavement? How much money are we spending on bridges, safety, pedestrian infrastructure, bicycle infrastructure, and so forth. And it is part of the Minnesota Go family of plans, uh, as mentioned before. So why does Minship matter? Uh, it guides investment uh, and projects and improvements on the state highway system. That chart on the right there shows how the different plans work together. We mentioned the Minnesota Go 50-year vision. That kind of directs everything below it. Um, Minship follows the multimodal transportation plan. Uh, obviously, that's not adopted yet, so we're not quite um, there on that one. Um, and then Minship, the 20-year plan, uh, also directly influences the 10-year capital highway investment plan, which are specific projects for each district of MnDOT. Uh, you may have seen that from Metro District uh, in front of you at this committee. And then that flows into the four-year STIP uh, and TIP and construction. So there is a pretty direct line between um, the investment direction developed for the 20-year plan and specific projects that get funded and constructed on state highways in Minnesota. It's 
It's also the 100 year anniversary of the state highway system um, and the history of that system is complex. Uh, there are a lot of positives that are associated with the development of that system in Minnesota. Uh, state highways improved access between cities and towns throughout the state, um, particularly supporting economic growth and vitality and really uh, improving access between regional trade centers. Um, but construction of state highways also divided, disconnected and destroyed some communities, particularly in urban areas. Uh, particularly BIPOC communities. Um, vehicle emissions continue to contribute to climate change. That's been another uh, potential negative of this. Um, and much has changed over the last 100 years, um, and we have a lot of work to do to make sure that our future decisions uh, ensure the benefits and burdens are equitable and we help reduce uh, previous inequitable, uh, previous or existing inequities. So I won't go through this slide in detail, I just wanna highlight that these are the, the funding sources that we consider as part of this plan. Again, this is for state highways. We have state funding sources on the left, uh, federal funding sources like IIJA or Bill um, coming in in the gold there. We also include any existing trunk highway bonds um, that we have as part of this plan as well. Um, I'll just note that a, a good chunk of the state funding goes to local distribution through the county state aid and municipal state aid program as well. Um, but when you follow that, the sort of flow chart off to the right there, the green, the state road construction funds is what we're talking about for Minship. We also spend money on debt service. We also spend money on operations and maintenance. Those are things like snow plowing, pothole patching. Operations and maintenance are not included in this plan. This plan is focused on capital construction dollars. So when we look at those revenue sources over 20 years, um, sum that up, we get a really big number, uh, 30 to $33 billion uh, over the next 20 years for uh, state highway investment. We put a range on it for this, for this time, uh, considering the, the different changes in funding sources for things like electric vehicles. There's a lot of future cert uncertainty on there, out there about how much money we're gonna get. So we put the range out there to give us a, a better frame of how much money to work from. In addition to identifying the revenue, we're also tasked with identifying how much need we have on the system. Um, the chart on the right shows the, in the green circle our revenue number. Um, in the green larger circle is our need number, the 52 to 57 billion. So even with that 30 to 33 billion, we have a pretty substantial uh, unmet need on our system as well. We're projecting a funding gap of between 19 and 27 billion. This is actually slightly larger uh, than the last plan, despite getting more money from the federal government. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. You're all aware of inflation being continuing to be a factor. That's been a factor for us for a while now as well. We also have uh, more work's been done on our planning processes to identify more needs. Um, and we have new state goals in, in multiple areas as well. That range on the need reflects uh, Minnesota successfully achieving the preliminary goal of reducing per capita v VMT. Uh, that Hallie mentioned. Um, if we were to uh, meet that goal, we think our need would be reduced by about $5 billion on the system. I'll also note, um, in addition to the 52 to 57 billion, we also uh, canvassed our local partners uh, to see what their priorities are on our state highway system that maybe don't fit within um, this number that we've identified for Minship. Uh, when we did that process, we identified an additional five to six billion in priority investments on the state highway system from cities, counties, MPOs. Um, we also took projects from the MPO plans as well for that. Does that revenue number that you're showing there include the money projected to come in from the Infrastructure Act to the state? It's yes. Over and above what we would have traditionally? Yep. It does, okay. Yep. Thank you. So when you're looking at 30 to $33 billion, um, with that higher level need, you have to make some trade-off uh, decisions. Um, as part of this process, we have identified a, mi a minimum of 23 and a half billion uh, to manage our highest risks and meet requirements for each category. So we realize there's, there's a minimum below which we just won't go uh, for things like pavement, bridge, some of our central investment areas. Um, there's also federal requirements and state requirements that we have to spend some of that money on certain things. Um, so when you take that 23 and a half billion away from the 30 to 33, we have about seven to nine billion that's kind of available for this trade-off discussion uh, that we're doing as part of the public engagement process. 
Um, I just want to highlight here our uh, investment tool that we have on the minnesotago.org website. It's at minnesotago.org slash investment. Um, it's a build your own budget tool. Um, when you log in, uh, this answers some of the questions we had before about uh, information. We are asking folks for um, home zip code, age, some other demographics as part of this um, survey tool right at the beginning so they can fill that out. And then there is a way to start. There's a couple ways to start on this. We have developed six different investment approaches here. Uh, they're shown on the screen. I won't dig into the details on them, but we've actually gone through the process of, of developing these different approaches to highlight different ways we could invest um, that we think are all, are, are all reasonable. Um, so that's one place you can start with this uh, budget tool. You can also start with the minimum investment levels here on the left um, and just build up from there. If you select an approach, they'll, it'll be kind of pre-populated for you. Um, and there's a lot of information in here, so you can click through on the different categories. We talked about technology a little bit earlier. You can click on advancing technology and see what that means for state highway investment. Um, you can click on the little tabs below each of those levels to see what your outcomes are associated with that investment, um, how many miles of road you get repaired, what percent poor there is for payment. Um, and on the right, you have your little budget tracker to show um, you're getting up close to the 30 to $33 billion at the top. And then if you go up too high, you get this little stop sign, budget exceeded. So you cannot submit it over $33 billion, um, which is a nice check on it to make sure it doesn't skew our, skew our numbers when we put that in. So uh, help us spread the word. You can share the link to the online investment budgeting tool. You can follow MinDOT on social media and share MinChip posts. You can sign up for email updates as part of this plan. You can also re request a presentation for your organization. Um, we are doing an interactive um, sort of survey. Um, we would do it here if we had more time, but um, we are doing that for in-person presentations as well. So you don't have to go through the budget tool, which is a little more in-depth. It's kind of a simpler uh, survey to do in person. And we're also traveling around the state attending community events. So we're not just doing virtual engagement. We are doing in-person events. Um, aiming to hit about six events in the metro area and two in each greater Minnesota district. Uh, they've been going really well thus far. We have already over 500 survey responses from uh, 10 in-person events thus far. Um, so that is going really well. When you say request a presentation for your organization, are you primarily dealing with governmental entities or are you, are you meeting with nonprofit organizations or service clubs or chambers of commerce? What, well, how wide do you cast that net for under the word organization? Right. Sure. We're uh, mostly doing uh, governmental organizations, although those are the ones we tend to talk to. Um, but if we did get a request from another uh, group, we would also present there as well. Mr. Chair? They yes, Commissioner. The they were at the Lakeville Chamber last week with the same, oh. a mostly same presentation. Yep. Okay. Good to know. Yes, Commissioner. Virtually. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the the first amount of money, it was what, 23 billion that you set aside. Is that calculated off of existing road structures, highways, bridges? Um, and how does that you know money bucket relate to the um, climate goals that we just talked about? Um, are you looking at different materials and is that budgeted in you know, um, different improvements? changing the width of roads and reducing highway uh, space and tar and blacktop. What, talk to us a little bit about how that money came to be and how it meets the climate goals that we just heard about. Thanks for that question. Uh, Chair and members, uh, that amount is mostly based off our existing system. Um, this plan doesn't really get into that detail of, of doing that different sensitivity analysis. I think that would come in um, once we're looking at, uh, for example, <coughs> pavement, um, different sustainable pavement um, uh, investment types um, when we're kind of doing the project development on that. Um, so for that one, I will say on the need side, we did factor that in on the VMT. Um, so, you know, if we met our VMT goals, it'd basically eliminate needing expansion anywhere in our system. Um, so that would kind of zero out that need number there. We did do it on the need side. We didn't do it as much. Um, on, on the state highway system side for investment. 
Um, but that's definitely so, something we can look into. Yes, Member Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have a follow-up question um, to the commissioners here. Could you speak to maybe a breakout of how you got to the need number? Maybe what degree of that is maintenance? What degree of that is proposed expansion? What degree of that is um, bridges, things of that nature? Do you have more detail there? Yeah, I don't have those numbers um, right in front of me, but I, I do remember that, here I'll go back to one of those slides just so I have those numbers in front of me. So if we look at that need number, we're at the 52 to $57 billion. Um, meeting our performance targets for pavement and bridge is the, are definitely the leading two for that. So uh, repairing our existing pavement, repairing our existing bridges, that's very much our existing system. Um, that, it takes, I believe, almost all of the money we have, uh, the 30 to 33 billion to meet those targets. Um, so any sort of current investment approach we have um, we're not seeing that we're going to meet that target because it just takes too much money. Um, from the mobility side, it's, it is pretty much that $5 billion I mentioned for expansion. Um, that's, that's the need. There's a little bit more in greater Minnesota as well, um, but that's, that's a pretty small number. Thank you. Member Geisler, would you want to comment on the issue that came up at the exec committee meeting about the, the fair share, I'll call it? Mm -hmm how we inadvertently sort of got ourselves in a position where the Metro wasn't getting its fair share out of the last solicitation? Uh, I'll, I'll comment to what I remember exactly of how we arrived at that, but it was um, effectively by, by focusing on preservation due to the VMTs that are in greater Minnesota, effectively money flew, uh, went out of the Metro area and towards greater Minnesota through some of the decisions we made <coughs> just by focusing on maintenance and preservation um, just due to the nature of the makeup of the system in the state. And so that kind of, uh, our historical decisions there has shifted the focus away from funding in the metro, which has then crippled other areas where we want to grow, be more sustainable, or focus on other other aspects in the metro funding. Um, so. Yeah. so I think the, the choices we made here that were made in other parts of the state that led to a, a thought about uh, preservation having some paramount significance, led to a situation in the last regional solicitation where we ended up with about 36% of the money being expended in the state when we are representing 55% of the population and 75% of the GDP. Uh, it was sort of an unforced error. I mean, we, with the best of intentions, we thought this was an important thing to be thinking about, but we ended up arguably not getting our fair share of the expenditures because there's more lane miles in greater Minnesota and more safety issues. And so I wonder, you know, how we avoid that problem in the, in the future, that uh, we make sure that regardless of the choices that we sort of collectively make, we, we, we get an allocation that's, that, that represents our fair share, if you will. And I know that, um, there's several commissioners in here that one of whom was in the legislature for years that would be thinking about fair share on a pretty consistent basis. Yeah, when we when we look at the numbers, the heavy pavement bridge focused um, definitely prioritized greater Minnesota. There's more miles out there. Um, although bridge um, is a little bit more even because there's a lot of big bridges in the metro area. It also goes back to a lot of those bridges have been repaired now. Um, and there's less of those mega bridges, particularly in the metro area. Um, and I think it also just reflects the older system. We have an old system out there that a lot of it needs to be redone, um, and there's a lot more miles in Greater Minnesota, so that tends to shift things a little bit as well. I don't mean to lay this on problem on you. I just want to raise it for the tab because as we're thinking about the next solicitation, I think we need to be mindful of, uh, you know, the potential implications of it and think that through. Yes. Commissioner. The one, I mean, it's, it's historic, the, you know, the disparity between greater and metro. Um, in my mind, the hope on the horizon is last redistricting, which further concentrated representation based on population in the seven county metro area. You know, you've seen more House and Senate districts. I mean, Dakota County alone it w went from having 18 legislators representing 
at least a portion of Dakota County to 25 legislative districts. And so I, we can't be the only county of the seven that saw increased numbers of districts within our county boundaries. So if in fact there is a solution that could be um, garnered, uh, historically you've had the core versus the uh, collar counties in conflict. And if and until all seven counties could get on board <coughs> with some type of uh, transportation <coughs> goals around funding, you might be able to make some progress given the redistricting. All right, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so you're showing a revenue versus need funding gap scenario. Um, from my experience, a lot of MnDOT's projects um, are not initiated by MnDOT necessarily, they're initiated by the locals. It seems to be a shift in the paradigm maybe of how these projects get done. So the question I have is on these, and I'm thinking specifically of, of Highway 10, for example. Highway 10, U.S. Federal Highway 10, Federal Highway, MnDOT's responsible for it. Locals led a, an improvement to that and it's currently under construction. So of this funding gap, do you have an kind of a breakout of what projects MnDOT would be moving forward with versus what projects would be locally led? So of, of the revenue number, that 30 to 33 billion, sort of what we're planning for for this plan, that would be all MnDOT led, because um, those, those are our projects, it's our system. The need um, would also be kind of almost all MnDOT led projects. We have identified money um, and set aside money to partner on those sorts of projects um, as part of our budget. So um, there's a little bit of money that we've identified to make sure we can uh, partner on those projects, uh, either regional solicitation projects or federal solicitations are coming as well. Um, so we have identified some of those needs as well. Um, in terms of the actual project, like a Highway 10 example, that may or may not be identified in this need. Um, that goes down to the last bullet point on this slide that we've worked with our local partners to identify sort of other state highway projects that they have priorities. Um, that's kind of above and beyond that 52 to 57 billion. So Mr. Chair, argu Go ahead. arguably the need is larger than because you're not factoring yeah. the locally led projects. Okay. And then just in terms of the work we do here on, on TAB, we oftentimes play with percentages in terms of, you know, do you, does more go for road and bridges or less go and who does it go to? We're gonna play with those percentages. So let me ask you the question of, if we reduce that percentage on road and bridge, does that help you or hurt you? Chair and members, um, help us or hurt us how in terms of? In, in terms of the projects we're working on, does that increase your need or reduce your need if we move it away from a road and bridge type of category? It would typically increase our need since pavement bridge is our highest need area. So if we reduce that, um, we'd have more need there. There's also a bit of a negative feedback loop on asset management where if you're spending less on things like pavement bridge, um, they get to a point where you just need to replace them where if you maintain them better, uh, you could limit those costs. So if we spend less on pavement bridge, it would definitely increase our need. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Mattis Castillo and then, and then Member Geisler. Yeah, thanks. I guess my concern, and I just want to raise it as a point, is that I'm still seeing these uh, separate buckets, right, with the climate action we just heard, this presentation, and I'm not seeing a connection. And I'm afraid, as we have seen over many years at MnDOT, is there's mm -hmm. a lot of silos um, and, and want to make sure that we're raising that climate investments in the long term will help your buckets and that we need to make sure that we're looking at those together and not separate and that they're not two different departments and I want to lift up the planners work to not be a plan but implemented and we need to see that in these numbers so I just want to raise that as a point. I don't think there's an argument there. Thank you Commissioner. Member Geisler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple points. Uh, one thing that I just want to highlight, Mr. Rutek, the, the reduction in VMT that you're hoping that will significantly reduce the need is pretty reliant on the multimodal plan we just saw beforehand, correct? Mm -hmm. so, so if we fund parts of the multimodal plan, that does reduce your need in a way yep. by helping accomplish the VMT goals. Okay, so, so it's not 
the money's going somewhere and it's just gonna in either directly or indirectly reduce the need either by providing money or potentially reducing the VMT need, right? Yeah, the way, the way I'd probably rephrase that is if we're successful in reducing VMT, whether by investment or people just continue telecommuting, for example, that will reduce the need on the state highway system. Sure. Yeah. So, but investment in the multimodal plan does assist in the reduction of VMTs, right? Yeah. Uh, the second thing I was going to say is um, just totally on a diff different tangent here. Um, this tool is really good. It's really easy to use. It's pretty straightforward. I liked it. I just I went into it blind. I didn't look at it anymore. Um, I like the, the information that's provided. It's consumable for an average citizen. So I, I think, one, props for building a good tool and, and thing there, mm -hmm. you know, credit okay. where credit's due. <laughs> uh, the one thing that I was really hoping for at the end of it, though, was a, here's what you decided to fund and here's what you didn't fund. And I think yeah. that provides a great opportunity of feedback, especially for your average citizen, because $33 billion is kind of a funny money number mm -hmm. for your average citizen. They don't really understand, you know, relatively how expensive things are. You don't think about the fact that we're going to spend billions on bridges, right? That sounds, yep. it's just kind of a crazy number when you're not dealing with that on a day-to-day -day basis. So having a good sense of like, here's what you did and here's what you didn't do would have been really beneficial without having to go in, and, and I love the content on each of the little bubbles, and it provided a lot of great context, but that kind of final report, if you will, uh, would have been really nice to have to just highlight, and your decisions res would have resulted in this. Um, and it, it just, it, but overall, I, it's very usable, it's very understandable, it's very straightforward, it's got a great UI, UX to it. So I, again, credit where credit's due, producing something that's a public engagement that's easy to use and also not bland. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Utek. Anybody else have questions? Yeah, thanks for those comments. And then uh, thank you for being here with us. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, hope we provided some uh, value to you as well. And then the last report out we have from an informational standpoint today is uh, it'll be short in nature, a regional solicitation outreach tool that's been put together by a, a relatively new uh, addition to staff, I think. Uh, Please uh, welcome Bethany Brandt Sargent. Uh, I don't think Steve Peterson's with us today, okay. but uh, see, she already doesn't, she doesn't need Steve. <laughs> we always, we rely on Steve all the time, but uh, you already discovered you can go it on your own. So Bethany, thanks, and it was nice to meet you in the exec committee meeting. So well, thank you, Chair. look forward Steve. to the presentation here. Steve is in a much more enjoyable place than we are. He's uh, in Hawaii on his way home. So <laughs> I am on my own today. And I do, I did have a PowerPoint, but I don't see it up, so I'm it's just, coming, yeah, it's yeah, coming. Come. Come. Okay. There we go. So what I'm gonna talk about today is some of our public input around the regional solicitation funding scenarios that's currently underway, and then a very brief uh, next steps. And so staff worked on a survey tool very similar to what Minship did to help identify what those funding buckets uh, or public input on the funding scenarios might be. And so the intent of this was to provide TAB with more information from the public that is current um, and not necessarily from the last TPP, but uh, more reflective of the process as we have it. Um, we do do public input at the development of those funding ranges, and then we do it in the TIP, and we thought this would be a nice middle ground to help uh, create those projects that ultimately end up in the TIP. And so I do have, let's see if I can get it up. Our survey is very simple. It's four parts. Um, it starts with quite a lengthy introduction. This first question is really important to how we will analyze the results, and that is to allow us to disaggregate uh, the feedback that we get from all of the various groups that do participate in our processes. And so the next step here is this budget, which you can do your $100 million uh, across all of the different uh, project types. And then... The final thing is a priority list. So within each of the modal ranges, um, you have to spend your money in one of these categories in the modes, which one would you choose? And the intent of this question was to say, if um, 
if you're going to put all your money in transit, we know you have to spend some money on roadways. And so what's your priority there? So getting people to think a little bit outside of their boxes and what their desires are. And so that is, it should take about five minutes. The survey does close tonight. We have received more than 550 responses so far. And so that's a, a pretty good number for a very brief survey like this. And so I think with that, I will um, open it up for any questions if chair members have. Mr. Chair. Yeah, sure. yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, did you find the responses to be somewhat parochial? That is, if you're living in downtown Minneapolis, you might have a little different approach to this answer than you would be on a collar county. I can give you an answer to that next month okay. uh, because it has not closed. We haven't done any analysis. We do ask for a zip code, which would be about the smallest demographic area that we can get to. So we will have some of that um, disaggregated information next month. Commissioner Gattel. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you. Uh, you know, I, again, I had a lot of conversation with staff over some of these tools that were put out, and I think there's a lot to be said for these tools and what they might be able to do. I know we specifically wanted to check in, but I think what staff didn't understand, at least at the Hennepin County, is that this was a kind of a check-in for them. They were going, well, you've already let the, the, the values out, so why am I even doing this? So, so there was a misunderstanding of the disconnect there, and I don't know if there was enough up front for them to get the gist of it. Thank you, Member Goodell. Yeah. Can you clear? Are you saying within the survey people didn't have enough information? Or yeah, I don't think they got why they were doing it after we'd already released the, what the modal oh. ranges were already at. Why are you doing it again in a budget to have a survey? They didn't get the reasoning that we had behind it, right? We are yes. looking for feedback because we may change it in the next solicitation, but I don't. I don't know that they understood that. I think. Our intent within this survey is that the, the modal ranges are already established. Yes. Exactly. And so we, we, we're not trying to reinvent that wheel. We already know those are the parameters that we have. What we wanted to do with this survey is to figure out um, maybe within the margins there of those funding scenarios how we can allocate this money in one potential scenario that reflects some of this public input. That, that didn't we get through. Yes. I'm, I'm just saying, and, and this is a good tool. I, playing with tools like this is a wonderful. They're creative. They have, they're a lot more engaging for people. They get them to think. So the, I did have them fill it out, but they will tell you, and they told me, this is bias because they said, we're going to fill this out because we want to get these kinds of projects because that's what we fund and that's what we have down in our hopper. That's going to happen for your county. It's going to happen for your county. It's going to happen for your city. That's how it's going to be, right? And so they, there's a bias built into this tool already. We did acknowledge that with that first yeah. question because we yep. do want to disaggregate that. So we do have, if you are on a policymaking board, you would click that. If you're a technical staff, you'd click that. Mm -hmm. um, advocacy groups, there's a whole list there. And we do intend on breaking that all out so that we can see where those uh, maybe nuances might be in the data. And obviously not trying to overwhelm the entire process with every data point, but it can give some trends and maybe some locational uh, highlights, like Commissioner Look was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think. I think. I think he was right on. So. Thanks, Commissioner. That's my. Comments. All right. Well, we'll look forward to the report out in September and the yes. results, and keep your eyes open for that troll from Grand Forks. No? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Todd. I see Todd Bewin has joined us. Do you want to come on up, Todd, to uh, yes. uh, occupy your usual spot around the sure. table and, and uh, give us a, maybe a quick update? And then I want to go to our, our colleague, George Schember, who uh, he and his wife had their bike wheels in the oh. Pacific and the Atlantic, and I want to hear just a little bit about that. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, sorry I was late. I was out slogging around in some wetlands today, doing some water monitoring with some staff, and it was fun. And I thought I might have to leave a little early too, so I just decided to stay in the back. But um, we didn't have too much to report today. The, the climate action framework is in the final stages of preparation. It'll be, I think the in, later in September, there will be a, a sort of a unveiling of that final product uh, from the governor and the uh, various agencies and departments. But. Um, it's uh, it's in it's in the works right now. So, 
that's yeah. that's all I really had. I didn't have much to report today, so I okay. let Elaine know that before I um, what, that I was going to be late as well. So is the MPCA doing much work around this carbon sequestration issue, whether it's um, you know I'll call it mechanical or or natural? Well, are you talking about the pipelines from the ethanol plants and things like that? No, I'm or? just talking about it generally, the, the, the notion of carbon sequestration and, and, um, and, and taking some kind of a position or offering some guidance on, on things, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, planting more trees and working on it from a natural standpoint in terms of reduction or it's uh, sticking it in the ground or whatever. Yeah, I would say that we're definitely take, we take a position on things like you know, tree planting instead of the natural, but the, the markets are gonna have a lot to say and just the, the technologies around some of those newer things and what's gonna happen with the ethanol plants and the, um, you know, their interest or their interest in um, capturing carbon from those processes, that's, that's in the free market and there's a lot of permitting that would need to occur with that. And, and so we're just, we're um, interested participants in that in the sense that we might have a role in permitting or something like that, but there's a lot of other steps that have to take place as well, Mr. Chair. Okay, thanks for that. All right, um, George, Member Schember. I'll, I'll be brief, end of end of the meeting. And I didn't ask for this, so you all are. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> Please I, direct I, I your comments to the chair. I would have sent in some photos to Janet um, so that we no. had some, <laughs> um, maybe next time. Anyways, I, I, my wife and I did, uh, we started in Oregon, we ended in uh, Annapolis, Maryland, and biked across 12 states. Uh, self-supported without a group it was just the two of us camping about 50 percent of the time so that's the context um, I would say our number one takeaway was that uh, uh, if you get off the interstate and get into the small towns the cafes the campgrounds the uh, uh, the bars we, we took advantage of that um, that people are really really outstanding. There's a lot of conflict on social media and in the press, et cetera. If you get out and do face-to-face -face and talk to people, they are uh, absolutely outstanding. And our faith in, uh, in humanity was, was vastly restored by being out there amongst people for roughly 80 days. Secondly, um, the investment in bikes and trails, we basically left um, the eastern or the western side of Ohio and biked all the way through to Annapolis, roughly 95% of the time on trail, off-road on trail, which is it was which was quite amazing compared to the western part of the United States, where uh, some of the most dangerous stuff we've we've seen, uh, where you're competing with logging trucks and cattle trucks and hay trucks and all sorts of other things out there. Um, but anyways, the investment in rail trails and and on-road trails or you know next to road trails. Um, in almost every community we saw through major towns like Des Moines, Columbus, Pittsburgh, Washington, D.C., um, you can tell the communities just kind of lift up when, when, they're, when they're investing in, in these things versus communities that uh, are letting it to the side. So that was uh, greatly appreciated. And then third, um, I would say if you're considering doing anything like that, um, just go for it. It's amazing what you can do if you do a little planning and a little, and, and you just start. We started with three-day rides last year and, and did a few four, overnight, four-night rides, and, and then all of a sudden we, we did an 80-day trip, 70 days biking. Um, we took a couple days off for snow in the mountains at 7,000 feet. That was interesting. Um, and we took a day off for heat in the east. So otherwise we were, we were rolling, and, and it's just amazing. Um, we've talked about what we would be willing to do for 80 days straight without, uh, without stopping, you know, what else would we do? And, and I came up with, how about I'm going to not use a public restroom for 80 days. <laughs> those do get old, um, but generally it was a great trip. So I would just encourage anybody that's thinking about making a trip like that, just go for it. It's quite an accomplishment. Thank you. Congratulations. All right. Anything else for the good of the order? Uh, yes. Uh, Member Keith Hansen. sent me a message apologizing for not being able to be here, and he did provide a brief report if you'd like me to share that with you. Would you please do that, Member Hansen, here as um, we wrap up? Um, I'll start out with Maple Grove uh, Transit. They are starting a new express route next week on the 22nd, serving the eastern portion of downtown Minneapolis from Maple Grove Transit Station. 
uh, Southwest Transit uh, ridership, uh, prime ridership, which is uh, right on demand, continues to grow. Uh, it's up 85% compared to the same time last year. Southwest Transit introduced three electric vehicles to their fleet last month. The vehicles are performing as desired in terms of range and mileage, and preliminary data suggest average fuel costs are down 75% compared to a gasoline vehicle. Um, Plymouth uh, initiatives are being uh, hindered by the driver shortage and, and trying to keep up with increasing wages. MVTA uh, Connect, which again is right on demand, set another monthly ridership record uh, in July. Ridership is up 200% compared to a year ago. There are some fall service changes planned by MVTA. Express trips uh, are being added to several Minneapolis routes to respond to increasing demands. This includes additional service to the U of M on Route 475 to respond to the Universal Pass updates. Um, updated trip times at uh, 46th Street LRT station um, and special event services to the Renaissance Festival, the State Fair, Vikings and Gopher football games. And generally, the, so the ridership experience uh, of the suburban providers is similar to what Councilmember Barber described, described for Metro Transit. Commuter ridership is down. Local ridership is up due to the popularity of ride on demand. All right, good. Member Hanson, thank you for that. Prompt any questions from anybody? All right, Member Anderson. I just want to acknowledge uh, this, this morning I saw a uh, Star Tribune contained an obituary for uh, Roger Shearer, who was a former council member, met council member for our district. Um, I just want to acknowledge the work that he did over his time here. He was uh, a, a good public servant, and he uh, served with a lot of common sense and good humor. So just wanted to make a mention Very of that. Good. One final thing. I did shoot a quick text over to the mayor of Plymouth. What did you get that $15 million for? <laughs> it's two bus platforms on either side of Highway 55, uh, a tunnel under the highway realigning County Road 73, which will involve some eminent domain, a roundabout, and some <coughs> other mobility improvements, preparations for all-day bus service, which is being funded in part by the regional solicitation in 25-26. So nice. there's a report on the $15 million. We stand adjourned. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thanks.